be going to Romans chapter 6. We'll get back on our study near Romans in a few weeks. Well, uh, Larry hit on this about that song, like Savior First of All. Lots of people talk about heaven and family members and saints of old and all that type of stuff, and yet Christ is the real prize that we should be looking forward to. Amen. Well, even if, as the song says, all we have is a cabin in the corner, we should be happy if Christ is there. Amen. And on the other side of that, you know, hell certainly is a reality, and if that's what God uses to get your attention, then that's his business, but ultimately sin is the problem. What we've been looking at here in chapter 6, really a good portion of the book of Romans, but we'll pick up here in verse 18, and we're going to look at the first part of verse 21 today. But we see here once again that sin was the problem. Mm -hmm. Verse 18 says, being free, or being then made free from sin, ye become the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness and to holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? We're going to stop the study there for the day. But if you recall previously, we looked at how we are either the servant of sin or the servant of obedience, either the servant of righteousness or unrighteousness. We cannot be both. We have to be one or the other. And now he's kind of continuing on that same thought here where he says being then made free from sin we are free from sin and its bondage its control you remember back in verse 14 he says sin shall not have dominion over you Amen. sin no longer reigns over us if we are in Christ now that doesn't mean we don't struggle with it in the flesh but Yet here, free from sin means that we've been liberated from it. We've been, even means to be exempted from its moral and mortal liability. That we're no longer held, if I can say it this way, we're no longer held under condemnation for those sins. We have been free from both the guilt of sin as well as the power of sin in Christ. Mm -hmm. I know we still struggle in this flesh, but that sin should not just have free reign over us anymore. Right. That is why we have this struggle with sin, as we will see very clearly in chapter 7. I think we, any who are truly saved here can express that struggle that we have with that sin which is in our flesh. Amen. Versus a spirit man who wants to do that which is right. You know, we were we were the slave of sin, fully under its condemnation, but yet Christ has made us free. Back in the Gospels, Christ said, Son has made you free, you are free indeed. Amen. Like I said, I know I've said it multiple times in our studying, but this word servant here means really a slave, a bondman, to be in bondage to it. Mm -hmm. And free is the, the exact opposite of that. We once were a servant of sin, but now we are free from sin. He goes on here next to say, being then made free from sin, you become the servant of righteousness. And this is the result of being made free from sin, that we now serve righteousness. Now we are bound to serve righteousness because Amen. they are free from sin. We are in a sense 
in bondage to it. Not like I said, we were either the servant of one or the other. Right. We either are going to serve sin and follow after the flesh, or we're going to serve righteousness and follow after God. There really can't be any in between. In fact, Christ very plainly said, You cannot serve two masters, for you will hate the one, love the other, or you will cleave the one, despise the other. Mm -hmm. But Paul, I think, makes it very clear here in the last several verses, too, that we are under one or the other. We are either under the dominion of sin, or we are under the dominion of grace, which calls us to serve God. Well, I would say if you've never, but if you've never truly been free from sin, you will not serve righteousness. Right. Now, there are some who will attempt to put on some righteousness, but Almost in every single case, you see those, they end up falling back away again. Mm -hmm. As Peter said, it's happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is returned to his vomit, and the sow that was washed through the wall and in the mire. Amen. Christ, I can't quote it exactly, but he tells of one who came into his house and found it swept clean and everything. It was all tied up. And then he said, when he left, he took seven. More spirits, more wicked than himself. Right. That is, when man tries to come in and clean up his life, oftentimes he leaves out and ends up in even more wickedness. Mm -hmm. But yet, when Christ makes us free, we're truly free from sin. Man. That is the problem with free will theology is that man is, man is in bondage to his nature to his <clears throat> and by nature we are in bondage to sin mm -hmm. <laughs> therefore our will will never choose to serve God in of itself because it will, so, it will always return right back to that sinfulness mm -hmm. let's go on to verse 19 here he goes on to say I speak after the manner of men as Paul here is using really this regular human figure of speech to Explain spiritual things is what he means. You know, he's not speaking some angelic language or something that needs special revelation. Right. Really, that is the whole of Scripture is, is that way, and yet without the Spirit, man will always misconstrue the Scriptures. Mm -hmm. Without the leading of the Holy Ghost, man will, even in the plainest of language, man will still miss the point of what God is saying. I don't think there's any more clear example of that than of Nicodemus when he went unto Jesus by night. Mm -hmm. Christ said, I mean, you must be born again. And of course, his first response was, how do I enter back in my mother's womb and be born a second time? Right. Because the carnal mind cannot understand the things of God. But he, here Paul says that he's using these this regular term that would mean a servant to describe our spiritual state. <laughs> he says, because of the infirmity of your flesh, because the flesh is feeble, the flesh is weak, the flesh is frail, the flesh oftentimes makes it difficult for us to understand spiritual things. Right. Even us that are saved, we are prone to think of things carnally if we're not careful. But Matthew 26, 41, Christ tells us the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Mm -hmm. The flesh likes to spiritualize and make things say things they don't say or right. The flesh likes to make things really more complicated than it is, and yet the Holy Ghost will lead us into all truth, the scripture says. But Paul says he just speaks after the manner of men because of the infirmity of their flesh. He uses these 
things that they could relate to, these things they could understand, even in a weak state, they could understand these things, he says. Yeah, I know we don't fully understand servitude in, only in America today. Right. We don't understand the, the, really the meaning of being a slave or being in bondage. But it was very applicable to the Romans and to those he was writing to here. But I think we understand other terms sometimes we can use. We understand how it is to go to work and how we are in a sense in bondage to our our workplace. Right. You cannot work for one company and then go out and work for the competition and expect things to work out. Can you? Amen. You know, I can't work for my company and then go out to a different radiator manufacturer. That's called a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. In fact, some places you have to sign an agreement saying you won't go work for them other places for so many months or years after you leave. Right. But we, he uses all this to just to try to paint the picture that we are either serving sin or serving God. If we had slavery today and so the letter was my master, he wouldn't be too happy if I went over to for the Jody's house and started working for him, would he? Right. But yet we, we try to do the same type of thing mm -hmm. in our flesh, don't we? We belong to God and we are to serve him, and yet if we leave the flesh to itself, we try to we'll end up serving the sin. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to the next part of verse 19 here. He goes on to say, For for as ye have yielded your members, <laughs> servants, <laughs> as ye have, for as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. You know, if you go back to verse 13, if you remember we were told to yield our members instruments of righteousness instead of instruments of unrighteousness. We are, that is, we are to give them over to, we are to present them to ourselves to be used of God rather than used of sin. Amen. And he says here that they once yielded themselves to, as servants to uncleanness to, and to iniquity unto iniquity. That is, they have given themselves over to serve that which was wicked, that which was morally impure, that which was lustful and transgressing God's law. That was our natural state, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. We walked according to the course of this world, according to the lusts and desires of the flesh. Ephesians 2 tells us. But even he has even here into iniquity unto iniquity. They added more and more sin to it. Right. That is what the natural man loves. That is what the our filthy flesh loves is to add more and more sin to it. You're right. Just like a sow likes to wallow in the mud, man by nature likes to wallow in sin. Mm -hmm. And left to ourselves, we will just add more sin upon more sin. Amen. I think that seems very evident in our society today, doesn't it? Man just goes farther and farther in sin. Left to ourselves, we would do the same thing. Left to ourselves, we would all be out there with the wicked today, adding sin unto sin. Mm -hmm. Notice he gives us the what we are doing said even so now. He says, now there should be a change. Before we serve sin, now there should be a difference in our life. Even so now yield ye or yield your members servants to righteousness and to holiness. Is, we are to be that slave, that bondman, we are to serve that which is right in the sight of God, that which is morally right, that's what righteousness is. And he says it will lead unto holiness, that is purity, God's type of purity. That's, Needs to be set apart or consecrated to God. When we 
serve righteousness, holiness is their end result. Amen. I know that doesn't seem to be a popular term in modern Baptist churches today. But yes, holiness is the requirement of the scriptures. You're right. Be holy as I am holy. Is what Amen. God himself has commanded us to do. No, that's not holy necessarily as the Pentecostals teach it, but can't say they're completely wrong on what they're saying in there, but really holiness is to be set apart for God. Mm -hmm. If we serve righteousness, we will be set apart to be used of God. That should be our really our desire as his people is to be used of him. Amen. We are vessels, and he is the one who, or he is the master, he's the one who says, this vessel is used for this, and this vessel is used for that. <laughs> the scriptures liken us unto the clay, and he is the potter, and he molds us as he will. Amen. It ought to be our desire to be used of God more than just a, quote, church ornament. <laughs> mm hmm Let's go on to verse number 20 here. He says, For when ye were the servants of sin, notice that's past tense. We're, if we're saved, we're no longer the servant of sin. He says, Ye were free from righteousness. Yes, just as we are free from sin now, we were in the same sense we lived a life free from righteousness before. Right. Well, sin has no control over us now. Righteousness had no control over us then, before we were saved. Well, sin has no claim to us now, and we had no claim to righteousness before God saved us. Well, just as we should have, we have no business serving sin, we had really no claim to serve righteousness before God saved us. Mm -hmm. I know I mentioned those sometimes. It, Try to come into church, try to live a good life, and hope they'll be pleasing to God. But until our nature has been changed, we will always ultimately serve sin. Amen. <coughs> so there's some that come in, they leave. Some people even out in the world that live a pretty, quote, moral life. Yet deep down, their nature is still wicked. Deep down, their desires are still lustful. Amen. If it weren't for the grace of God, every last one of us would run full speed in the wickedness, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. so that's what happened in the old world before the flood. We have, you know, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. That's why we. We must understand and must say with Paul, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be puffed up. With, think of how good we are or how bad we're not. Or, or boast about things we do or don't do, as the Pharisee did there in the gospel. But a true understanding of who we are and what God has saved us from will cause us to be humble on the side of God. Amen. We know from Isaiah, he says that all our righteousnesses were as filthy rags. Mm -hmm. <laughs> until God gives us his righteousness, all the righteousness, quote unquote, that we could have done was not pleasing to him. Amen. So the problem goes back to sin once again. Sin really has tainted even the best of our works outside of Christ. And that is why a good work salvation will never work because even our good deeds, quote unquote, are marred by our sin nature until Christ saves us. Amen. We cannot be accepted except in the blood of as Ephesians chapter 1 tells us we cannot be accepted unless we are in Christ. Let's go on to verse 21. 
go ahead and bring this to a close here. He says, what fruit had ye then in those things where we are now ashamed? So what fruit had you then? Before the Lord saved you, what kind of fruit did you have? Right. Well, I'd say, according to the Gospels, you had corrupt fruit, didn't you? Matthew 7, 17 mm -hmm. tells us a corrupt tree brings forth corrupt fruit. Mm -hmm. I think it's in the next verse. He says, a good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. It doesn't mean that it's not possible for someone to do Things that are good in the eyes of men, but honestly, it's not it's not possible in the sight of God to be pleasing to Him outside of Christ. As long as your nature is corrupt, as long as you're still in your sins, your fruit will always be rotten and poisonous. Right, it will always be a stink in the sight of God. No matter how pleasing it may be to your fellow man. But he says, what fruit have ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Do we really feel ashamed of the sin we used to live in? I think there I know I've heard some people they almost seem to brag about the sin which they used to live in. Mm -hmm. Right. But what about even our sin which we commit now? That should be we should be ashamed of that sin. Amen. Sin is nothing to brag about. You're right. Let's turn over to Jeremiah and one verse before we close here. Jeremiah chapter 3. Like, sin is the reason Christ had to die. Sin is the reason he had to suffer. Sin is the reason we were separated from God all the way back in the beginning of the garden. Sin is the reason that this world is full of death and suffering. So we shouldn't think very lightly of our sin. Amen. Amen. What Isaiah, or me, what Jeremiah has to say here in verse 25 of chapter 3, speaking on really the behalf of the nation of Israel, he says, We lie down in our shame and our confusion. That could also mean dis disgrace covereth us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, and from our youth even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Amen. This should be a way we look upon sin, that it's a, a shame in the sight of God. It's not, certainly we can praise God for what he saved us from, but we should never look back upon that sin and say, well, yeah, I was Pretty bad off. That almost has a point to brag about it. Mm -hmm. well, I know my testimony, Donna's testimony, was similar in the fact that we were pretty good kids <laughs> to the Lord saved us, and we yet, even in that, we were still wicked in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I thought I was okay until God finally showed me that I needed a Savior. Amen. Well, even that quote, being a good kid, was not <laughs> pleasing to God. It's not something we could even brag about then. Because before God saved us, we were really nothing to be bragged about. Amen. No sin, whether it be now or in the past, it should, it should in a sense, be a shame to us. It certainly shouldn't be something we should brag or boast about. Amen. That Romans 12, 9 tells us that we are to abhor that which is evil. Amen. The sin should, should disgust us. They should, we should hate the sin which killed our Savior. <laughs> but I don't see very much shame in sin in our modern day. I'm going to go ahead and close with that. We'll, we'll pick up where we left off next week. <laughs>